before we get underway, I just want to remind people that um, the attendance policy aspect it has to do with the practicals. Um, if you missed a certain number of classes in the first half of the semester, you couldn't take the first practical. Um, and uh, for the Monday Lab group, since they took their practical yesterday, uh, we're sort of restarting the count leading up to the second practical. And the Wednesday groups and your practical tomorrow, uh, the count ends. If you're here today, obviously, then you're it's not counting against that. And then uh, Thursday, that'll start up uh, counting towards uh, being able to take the second practical. Um, <clears throat> I was a little surprised this semester. I have a couple of students who actually didn't get to take the first practical, not this class necessarily, but um, I didn't think I'd have to enforce that policy so immediately, but uh, there you go. Um, so uh, in the second half of the semester, we're starting, um, well, yeah, we're starting the immune system chapter, uh, which is finishing off the unit on transportation. Um, or not transportation, circulation or whatever it's called. Um, and uh, this chapter kind of, uh, is, I don't know, kind of an orphan chapter. It's put in with the cardiovascular system, but it's not the cardiovascular system. Um, and uh, we could expand this unit and basically the book has the four chapters, the blood, heart, vessels, and then this chapter all together um, are basically the circulatory system and the circulation aspect of things is the lymphatic portion, which is what we're gonna cover today. Um, but then the immune system itself is just this completely uh, unique aspect to this course. It's a system that uh, is really just functional. It uses parts from all the different parts of our body. Um, and uh, the way I used to organize this course, the uh, immune system section with its own unit. I had um, uh, four unit tests. The first unit test was basically the um, nervous and endocrine system regulation aspect of things. And then the second unit was um, the cardiovascular system. And then this had its own unit. Uh, actually, when I first started doing it, the book that we were using uh, had two chapters, one on the lymphatic system and one on the immune system. Uh, so it was a bigger chunk of the book. But uh, conceptually, it's a big chunk of the class, whether it's one chapter or more. Um, and then the last unit was the um, respiratory, digestive, and urinary systems, which all are very uh, intertwined with each other. And the book has them in a unit called Environmental Exchange, Environmental Exchange, which uh, is sort of how we'll think about them when we get to them after this. And then just as uh, another sort of a uh, separate part of the book, I tacked on the reproductive system um, at the end uh, with the other three, although it wasn't part of environmental exchange exactly. Um, so I've organized the course differently. We're dealing with things basically on a chapter by chapter basis as far as testing is concerned. But um, <clears throat> getting into the lymphatic immune systems, uh, it really does borrow a bit from the cardiovascular system, especially in that uh, the major part of what uh, <clears throat> is responsible for immune function are white blood cells, obviously blood cells. Um, but then also the other thing, which I ended up uh, last time we met um, talking about is <clears throat> in the vascular chapter, vasculature chapter, just this idea of how uh, filtration is driven um, with the sort of arterial blood pressure coming in the capillaries and reabsorption is driven 
as the blood pressure in capillaries drops off before it reaches the venous side of circulation. The um, <clears throat> absolute value, if you will, of the um, pressure behind these two functions of capillaries is not equal. There's 10 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure driving filtration and only 7 millimeters of mercury uh, driving reabsorption. Now, I said absolute value of those because uh, if you can think back to grade school uh, arithmetic, absolute value is just ignoring the positive or negative aspect of a, uh, an integer. So 10 and 7 are not equal. Um, the positive here is just really determining the direction of movement. The positive uh, 10 millimeters of mercury means that that's pressure in the bloodstream pushing things out for filtration. And the negative 7 is the uh, pressure in the bloodstream is low so that the osmotic pressure is pushing things back in for reabsorption. But the two pressures are not equal which means that more things get filtered out of the blood than get reclaimed back into the blood. And the major thing that we're concerned with here is water. And so the lymphatic system is really where we see we, we, how we reclaim that water. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as I was kind of setting this up and I said that uh, the original book when I started teaching here we had two separate chapters on the lymphatic and immune systems, um, <clears throat> did a good job of establishing that they're not the same thing, but every book that we've used since then puts them together in the same chapter. Um, <clears throat> the lymphatic chick system is more than the immune system or is somewhat separate from it. Uh, they just get put together because a lot of immune function seems to take place within the anatomy of the lymphatic system. But that's not really a good way of uh, picturing the two systems. Um, <clears throat> this part of the book here uh, kind of discussions discusses what the functions of the lymphatic system are. But let me instead um, spell it out a little bit more explicitly. Its main function is to, um, oh, great, what's the word I wanted here? Um, oh, that's right. Um, drain excess fluid from uh, tissues. That's kind of an awkward way of stating it. Um, there are two other functions that I want to talk about with the lymphatic system, but before I get to those, let me explain what this drain excess fluid uh, is talking about. Um, and I'm going to try to do this somewhat graphically with what is really just a text field here, but um, in the blood, there is the fluid component, which is plasma. And uh, <clears throat> so that double line I've just drawn in there represents the capillary wall, if you will. On the other side of the blood vessel, so kind of go back to this picture, uh, the white space outside the blood vessel here um, has in it what is called interstitial fluid. Um, you could also think of that as extracellular fluid. It's just the fluid that fills whatever tissue the blood supply is uh, um, exchanging with. The water that comes out of the plasma, driven by that uh, 10 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure, is sort of where that interstitial fluid comes from. Um, but it's not exactly just uh, plasma coming out, because there are things that can't get out of the bloodstream, um, mainly the plasma proteins. They don't filter out of uh, blood vessels except under certain conditions, which we'll actually get to talking about later on with the uh, immune system. Um, <clears throat> then not all of the water that's filtered out of the blood vessels is reclaimed back into the blood, which makes the plasma a little 
uh, hyper, I mean, hypotonic, wait, is that right? hypertonic compared to what it was before, uh, or a little more concentrated. And so that fluid water has to get back into the plasma eventually. And that's what the uh, lymphatic system is for. Um, interstitial fluid ends up getting reclaimed into vessels. And I think I showed you the picture last time back before break. And I'll pull it up again in a little while. Um, the fluid is reclaimed into lymphatic capillaries, which will eventually uh, return that water back to the blood. When that fluid moves into the lymphatic system, we call that lymph or lymphatic fluid. Um, I'm just putting both terms there because you'll see them, see it referred to as either of those things. Um, lymph just is the easiest way of saying it. Um, <clears throat> there's actually no difference between interstitial fluid and lymph. They're the same thing. The only difference is where we find them. So it's sort of a geography issue. When the fluid is in the extracellular space of a tissue, it's interstitial fluid. When the fluid is in the lymphatic system, it's lymph. But uh, composition-wise, they're basically the exact same thing. Plasma is different from them, mostly because the plasma proteins don't filter out uh, across the capillary wall. But they're all related uh, fluids. Now, I want to define one other uh, fluid, which is separate from all of this, or not separate, but... Um, sort of getting away from the, the filtering things out of and reclaiming uh, <clears throat> fluid. And that's called chyle. All that chyle is, is it's lymph plus lipids. Okay. Because the second major function of the lymphatic system is to transport dietary lipids. What that means is in the digestive system, when we're absorbing nutrients out of the food that we've digested, um, the lipids go into the lymphatic system. Everything else goes directly into the bloodstream. Eventually, those nutrients need to be delivered by the blood to your tissues so you can get glucose to your cells to make ATP or amino acids to your cells for them to make um, proteins, and then lipids need to eventually get to the cells too, uh, to be used either for energy or for making uh, membranes or um, uh, steroid hormones, whatever it might be. There are a lot of, there are a number of different things that lipids can do. However, we don't just automatically absorb the lipids into our bloodstream. They go into the lymphatic system, and then they get transferred to the bloodstream where the blood will take them to the tissues and eat them. Why would lipids need to be handled differently from the other nutrient molecules? What's special about lipids? A lot of energy. There's a lot of energy in um, carbohydrates and amino acids. I mean, granted, there's more in lipids, but there's something that's definitely unique about lipids. You're hydrophobic, right. When you hear lipid, you should always immediately think hydrophobic. Because okay? that's their defining principle. It's why we have cell membranes. It's why uh, certain hormones have to be transported in the blood by something else and their uh, receptors are inside the cell. There's always going to be a difference about things. Lipids are hydrophobic. Everything else is hydrophobic. Okay. Now, so given that lipids are hydrophobic, which is very important in considering lipids, why do they need to go through, now why do we not want them to go into the blood immediately out of our digestive system? Water. Because the blood's a water environment. That is the point I was going for, but if you think about that too hard, lymph is a water environment too. But we don't want lipids to go into the bloodstream because being hydrophobic and shoving them into a water environment, they're going to do what? Put that in order. You can do it. 
that's a little indirect, but yeah, eating too many lipids can affect your blood pressure. But what are they going to do in the bloodstream? We throw them in there. Let's take a syringe filled with lipids and just inject it into your bloodstream. What's that going to do? Clump up. Hmm? Clump up. Right. It's what we call a fat embolus. It's effectively the same thing as a blood clot as far as circulation is concerned. It's not a blood clot. A blood clot is, uh, you know, fiber mesh like we learned in the... But a fat embolus and a blood clot or a platelet plug, any of those things, are going to have the exact same effect on the cardiovascular circulation, which is to plug up a blood vessel and potentially cause a stroke or a heart attack or where whatever, depending on where the, the blockage is. It's going to block circulation. So you don't want dietary lipids to go right into the bloodstream because they're going to mess up the blood's very important function of delivering oxygen to tissues. Okay. In the lymphatic system, dietary lipids can be processed and uh, associated with carrier proteins so that they can eventually travel through the bloodstream safely. Those carrier proteins that we find carrying lipids in the bloodstream are called lipoproteins. Um, you've probably heard reference to lipoproteins, but not necessarily by that particular name, because you've probably heard them in reference, heard them referred to by their common abbreviations. There are two common lipoproteins. There's high-density lipoprotein and low-density lipoprotein. Now, how would you abbreviate those two things? HDL and LDL. Yeah, HDL and LDL. Where have you heard of those? Yeah, when you get a lipid panel done, blood work done, checking your cholesterol after starving yourself all night, um, the two numbers that they're most concerned with are HDL and LDL, and they call HDL good cholesterol and LDL bad cholesterol. They're not good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. They are lipoproteins that carry cholesterol, and the difference is one of them carries cholesterol in a very tightly packed, high-density configuration, which holds on to the cholesterol a lot better than the low density version, which the cholesterol can kind of leak out of, so to speak. You have a high LDL number, the bad cholesterol number, then you're more likely to get cholesterol buildup in your uh, blood vessel walls or atherosclerosis. So uh, it's better to have high HDL numbers because you're transporting the cholesterol in your bloodstream better. Um, I thought it was the opposite. No. HDL. HDL is good cholesterol, LDL is bad cholesterol. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a high LDL number and you're like, all right, good cholesterol, you're wrong, it's bad cholesterol. You need to get the LDL number up, down, the HDL number up. So. And also it's the ratio between the two. I'm oversimplifying the, the results from a lipid panel, but that's essentially it. Um, there are actually other lipoproteins. Uh, there's a uh, VLDL, which is very low density lipoprotein, which is like horrible cholesterol or something like that. Uh, but it's a fairly rare lipoprotein, so it's not usually considered a lipid pro, uh, panel. <laughs> but um, the lymphatic system absorbs the lipids directly from your digestive system and then they're processed through the lymphatic system to eventually be associated with lipoproteins so they can be carried through. Um, some of the lipoproteins are actually coming from the liver, so the lymphatic system will deliver the lipids to the liver and the liver will then package them up with those lipoproteins, um, as well as a few other places. So <clears throat> when those lipids are in the lymphatic system, we call that chyle. That's just lymph with a high density of uh, lipids in it. And then we come to the <clears throat> third function, which is uh, they have to do with immunity. The lymphatic system has to do with immunity. Really, <clears throat> the main function of the lymphatic system is draining the excess fluid from your tissues. The other two kind of just piggyback onto that. So as you're draining excess fluids from the digestive tract tissues, uh, you're also going to be taking up the lipids. So the lipids can then travel through 
that non-cardiovascular part of your circulation until they're safely packaged up in lipoproteins. And then, uh, and so that's really draining the excess fluid from the digestive system tissues. But draining excess fluid from any tissues uh, <clears throat> plays into the immune function that we associate with lymphatic system because um, any potential pathogens or signs of disease or damage in your body will express themselves, so to speak, in that fluid. Okay, so if you have uh, viruses in your system because you picked up a cold from somebody, those virus particles will be in that fluid and that'll move through the lymphatic system. Uh, if you have an infection because of that virus, then infected cells in your respiratory tract or wherever the virus has an effect will move through the lymphatic system with that fluid that's being uh, drained. <clears throat> so we'll see a lot of the immune function we're going to talk about, not so much today, but later as we deal with this. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, chapter. Uh, <clears throat> later when we deal with this chapter, we're talking about immune function, a lot of it's taking place and being described in the lymphatic system because a lot of it's taking place within this fluid uh, that comes from any tissue in your body, but then specifically moves through these structures. <clears throat> what we're going to do today is pay most attention to what that lymphatic system is and what its structure is. Um, and to some degree in the context of um, this uh, draining tissue. So, oh, uh, um, I really need to get uh, some pictures onto the server so I can pull them up in class. This is a picture out of the book showing the basic structure of the lymphatic system. Um, we associate the color red with arteries and blue with veins and yellow with nerves. Uh, get used to also seeing green, which is for lymphatic system. Those four things, arteries, veins, nerves, and lymphatic vessels, usually all travel together. So you're going to usually see all four of those colors bundled together in one place. Uh, sometimes you don't. That doesn't mean that one of them's missing. It probably just means that the, the model or picture you're looking at left one of them out. But generally speaking, you should see all of those things together, whether it's running through the central canal of an osteon and a bone, or uh, we'll see how those types of structures uh, get to digestive system digestive tract organs, there's a special conduit for them. Oh, yeah. So when you see green, think lymphatic. Um, now, uh, when I pull this picture up and I realized I need to put corrected pictures on uh, the server so I can pull them up in class, it's because there's a problem with this picture. And I've sent a corrected version to the um, OpenStax people and hopefully they'll update it. But updating figures takes them uh, like four or five months, so it's not going to be up in time for us to do it. But um, this little circle here, uh, they say is an inset to this structure here, but that's actually, this is not what the inside of this organ looks like. Okay. But what I do want to use this inset for is, this just shows um, capillaries that are going through tissue, so all these little circles with the blue background that just represents some tissue in the cells of that tissue. And then the red conduits are the capillaries bringing the blood through. Again, water is filtering out of that at a higher pressure than water is being reabsorbed back into the blood vessels. And so in green we see um, lymphatic capillaries which are taking up that excess fluid. Um, they have drawn in here very nicely uh, as these lymphatic capillaries come together and they get wider and wider in diameter, then we start to see uh, valves in here, which just like valves and veins or the heart, are there to make sure that the fluid only moves in one direction. So these capillaries here, uh, which are closed capillaries, it's, the, it's not a uh, circulatory system like the cardiovascular system with arteries that capillaries to veins, is capillaries feed into everything else, and they actually originate in the tissue. 
and so they draw the fluid up into them and then eventually that fluid will move past a valve and it can't get back into this tissue and it helps to uh, make sure that the fluid drains out. Um, so that's what's happening down at the microscopic level. But then as those lymphatic vessels come together, uh, they make up larger and larger um, tubes that are draining that fluid out of the extremities and all of the tissue, and eventually going to, it's going to get all of that back into um, the cardiovascular circulation at the subclavian veins right there. Now, in this picture, they can't have drawn in all of the uh, lymphatic vessels, just like if we had a picture showing you the cardiovascular system, you wouldn't see all of the arteries and veins and capillaries drawn in because it would just fill the whole thing. So places where you see no green stuff drawn in, like uh, this area right here, up here, that's not to say that there aren't lymphatic vessels there. They just simplified the picture a little bit. But draining from any of the tissues all over your body um, are these vessels that come together eventually. Um, oh, another problem with this picture that I fixed and pointed out to them. Uh, this thing that's colored blue right here really should be green because it's still part of the lymphatic system. And they didn't label this structure right here. Um, this structure is what's called the uh, cisterna chile. Let me just write that on the board. Uh, it's elsewhere in the book. But for the sake of um so um, that's this big thing here, which again is colored blue in the picture, and really should be colored green because it's part of the lymphatic system. Um, it's an enlargement of the lymphatic vessels uh, that all of the lymphatic vessels from the lower body, meaning the legs, and from the um, abdomen a lot of that being the digestive tract organs, all of that drains into this space right here. So it's called the cisterna chile because all the lipids it's absorbed out of the small intestine is going to be in there that's containing chile, that lymph plus lipids fluid. That's where it gets its name. And then cisterna is just uh, referring to the fact that it's a large space that can store that fluid. Coming off of the cisterna chile is a lymphatic duct that goes straight up. Again, it should be colored green, not blue. Um, and it's going to hook over and connect to the subclavian vein over here. Um, the cisterna chile, which is draining everything from the lower body and the abdomen, especially the digestive tract, all of that feeds up into the left subclavian vein. From the point where we have the cisterna chile down, everything drains to the left side of the system. From the cisterna chile up, the right side of the thorax, the right arm, right shoulder, right uh, neck, and right head, all drain into the right side of the baby vein. And the left thorax, left arm, left shoulder, left neck, left head, all drain into the left side of the baby vein. Um, there's a figure I'm going to show you in a little bit uh, that sort of shows the difference of what's drained to the right side and left side. And this picture is where I can show you the, uh, the dividing line between everything from the lower body and then it's split right and left from that point up is at the cisterna chile. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, um, this picture here just shows how the lymphatic capillaries work a little bit better. Um, so again, where we have uh, a capillary bed, 
they're lymphatic capillaries that are closed off. They're not draining from somewhere else. They're absorbing all of the excess fluid from this tissue and uh, carrying it out. The way that works is actually a fairly simple but very elegant um, structural relationship between these types of vessels. Um, so again, green represents the lymphatic system. So these green things are the cells that make up the wall of the lymphatic capillary. And the capillary, again, is closed off here. There are flaps of that endothelium, uh, the You would think after spring break, I wouldn't be dropping words so quickly. Um, the lymphatic capillary endothelial cells here uh, are connected out into the surrounding tissue by uh, these little collagen fiber tethers. And uh, then we have the tissue cells represented here, just amorphous cells, whatever they are, with blue space in between them representing where the interstitial fluid would be. As an interstitial fluid fills with the uh, water that's been absorbed or filtered out of the bloodstream, the tissue will swell and all of the parts of the um, tissue will basically move away from each other as the volume of interstitial fluid goes up. And so where these collagen fibers are attached will pull away from where the capillary is. And it'll open up each of these little flaps and the fluid will drain into the capillary and then we'll get past this valve and uh, the capillary will end up being empty and the fluid will drain. And then when more fluid uh, <coughs> filters into the tissue, the, the tissue swells up again, the collagen fibers pull the endothelial flaps open and the fluid drains out. Okay. So as the tissue swells, just the physical expansion of that swelling tissue will pull these endothelial slap flaps open so that the tissue can drain into the, in, into the lymphatic capillary and uh, move away out past the um, valve that we see there. Um, <clears throat> you could probably, with a very uh, sensitive, I don't know, maybe even MRI kind of machine, you could probably see uh, sort of a pulsing of every tissue with each heartbeat as uh, more blood volume is pumped out from the heart, uh, more um, fluid will be filtered out of the capillaries and make each the tissue swell just a little bit with each heartbeat. And then uh, with each swelling and expansion of the tissue, the fluid will move into the capillaries and drain away. And you could probably, again, with a fairly sensitive uh, MRI kind of set up, you could probably see this happening within the tissue anywhere. They'd just With each heartbeat, there'd be just a little bit of a swelling of the tissue and then it'll drain off. Then it happened again with the next heartbeat and the next heartbeat. So I don't know if that's actually been done, but I would imagine that you could do that. I have seen something like that for... Oh, um, I have seen something like that for the production of cerebrospinal fluid, that you can see a pulsing in the brain with each heartbeat as the cerebrospinal fluid's made, which is very tangentially related to this. But the idea is that you can actually see the, the pulsing of fluid in the body if you look closely with a particular organ, at a particular organ, with a uh, sensitive uh, assay-like uh, MRI. All right, come on. Um, here's the picture I was pointing at, uh, <coughs> mentioning earlier. So this shows you uh, what parts of the body drain to the left subclavian vein and what parts of the body drain to the right subclavian vein. And uh, the cisterna chile, and here's where it's actually labeled in the book. Um, the corrected version of that picture I was showing you again about, showing you earlier, I told them to label the cisterna chile that was painted blue and should be painted green. But here it's actually painted green. Um, and that's basically the dividing line, where the cisterna chile is. From that point up, the right side of the body drains the right subclavian, the left side of the body drains the left subclavian. 
but from the cisternal chile down, all of the lower body, both legs and uh, the entire abdominal cavity, all drain into the cisternal chile because of all the lipids that are being drained from the um, small intestines. Uh, and all of that ends up going into the left subclavian vein. Um, in this picture, there are a couple little green things uh, extending away from the cisterna chile, which was, is actually showing how things drain in. They're not labeled here, but one of them is probably the right lumbar uh, lymphatic trunk. The other is the right lumbar lymphatic trunk, which are basically draining the right and left leg tissue fluids. And then they only show a third one here, but there's probably a few uh, branches of the intestinal trunk, which is draining all of the um, lipid-rich fluid from the digestive trunk, digestive tract. Um, so all of that's draining into the cisterna chile there. And that's why from that point down, all of the body drains together from the cisterna chile up, that there's actually a separation between right and left. Cisterna chile and the thoracic duct drain to the left along with um, vessels coming from the left uh, torso, arm, head, and neck. And then the right torso, arm, head, and neck all drain separately. If you look closely at these two little inserts, there's a nice thick thoracic duct coming in on this side, which is what's drawn in the green down below. There's no similar thing on the right side, because there's no large duct like that draining in. We just have branches that are coming from the head, neck, and arm, and thorax there. There's no huge significance to this difference here, other than it's just from the uh, <clears throat> digestive system, there's no separation right and left below the cisterna chile. Everything from that point down drains together, and so from the cisterna chile up, it has to go to one side or the other, and it happens to be the left side that it goes to. So <clears throat> that's why we have this little pattern showing the purple, which is what's draining into the right subclavian vein, and the yellow, which is draining into the left subclavian vein. Um, now, what I want to talk about for the lymphatic system is talk about the organs that we find in the lymphatic system. And normally, I just go right to that. The book, however, then introduces, um, I don't know, a preview, if you will, about immune function, um, which is, it's here because it has to do with the functions of the lymphatic system. Um, which I listed here. So the immune function of the lymphatic system uh, is um, needs to be addressed. So they do that here. Um, I actually pulled this picture up from the um, blood chapter earlier. I forgot it was in this chapter. But um, remember when we were looking at blood, I showed you the... Um, uh, flow chart of how the stem cells and the red bone marrow give rise to different types of blood cells. The reason we want to talk about it here is because the lymphatic system is associated strongly with the lymphocytes. They're white blood cells. They're blood cells, just like all the others, but uh, they're called lymphocytes because they're associated with the lymphatic system. Um, <clears throat> We're actually going to be talking about a few other white blood cells when we get to talking about immune function also. But um, we see, since we're talking about the anatomy of the lymphatic system, we see lymphocytes in these tissues pretty consistently. And the two main types that we're going to need to see are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, or T cells and B cells. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, probable that you've heard reference to T cells before um, in diseases like AIDS where there's a immune deficiency that's usually measured by specifically counting how many T cells people have 
Um, and for AIDS, that's uh, important because HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, actually infects T cells directly. And so it affects uh, the ability of the immune system to do its work by um, basically killing off this type of cell here. Um, so I, like I said, I pulled that up from uh, the blood chapter, actually, because I forgot that it was in this chapter here, but this is basically the same thing, showing you the different types of cells. Um, and we will uh, talk about all these types of cells in more detail later on, but uh, just since it's covered in the chapter here and the types of cells are kind of relevant to the structure we want to talk about, B cells are responsible for uh, making antibodies. Um, and then T cells are responsible for interacting with uh, diseased and damaged cells in your body. Plasma cells, which I would have preferred that they put right after B cells, are just a um, <clears throat> differentiated version of a B cell. Um, they're called plasma cells because they secrete um, antibodies into the plasma for the most part. So when we're talking about plasma proteins, there's albumin and uh, um, globulins and fibrinogen. One type of globulin is a gamma globulin or a, a immunoglobulin, which is also called an antibody. And plasma cells are the cells that make that secreted into the plasma. <coughs> But they are really just B cells uh, in their sort of fully differentiated form. And then there are natural killer cells, which are a special type of lymphocyte, um, which are responsible for going out and destroying cells that are damaged or diseased or infected in your body. Um, and we'll meet them later on. But uh, <clears throat> these three types of cells, uh, Uh, we have natural killer cells here, which is also uh, called a large lymphocyte, and this is the only time we'll refer to it as the large lymphocyte, but that's in comparison to the small lymphocyte, which can either be a T cell or a B cell, and then B cells are the ones that become plasma cells. And we'll talk a lot more about all of these cells as we get into this, but here they're just being introduced to us. Um, <clears throat> So the rest of what I want to talk about today, and hopefully I can do this in a half hour, um, hopefully I can do it in less than a half hour, um, is just this, the structures of the lymphatic system, the organs of the lymphatic system. And um, there's two ways to go about talking about these, and I'm actually going to kind of touch on both ways. Uh, one way is the way that the book does it, and the other way um, is the way that I kind of, I'm used to doing it, and I, uh, there's a reason to go through that way. Um, the first thing is to separate lymphatic organs into two groups. And just get that stuff off the screen. There are primary oops, lymphatic organs, tissues, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And there are secondary genetic organs, tissues. Um, and there's a number of those. I'm putting in some spots here. I don't remember exactly how long that list needs to be, uh, but we'll fill that in. So one way of separating and talking about these is to talk about the primaries and the secondaries separately. Um, and I used to not explain it this way. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about a little later on will sort of the way I usually explained it. But this is an important distinction to make. It's just I didn't used to include it because making this distinction requires having heard about the lymphocytes. And I never talked about the lymphocytes at the beginning. But the book introduces lymphocytes before, which is good because it's a place to talk about it here. 
Now, first off, I want to mention that the book says, well, the book says lymphoid, I think. I say lymphatic. I don't really care about whether there's any grammatical difference between those two words. Um, I'm just used to saying lymphatic. But lymphat lymphatic, lymphoid, they're interchangeable words as far as I'm concerned. Um, also, I want to mention that I'm saying organs and tissues, and I think the book kind of says organs. Um, but truthfully, uh, when we're talking about the primaries, one of them is an organ, the other one's a tissue found inside another organ. So it really makes more sense to say organs and tissues. So the first thing is red bone marrow, and that's the tissue. Okay? Red bone marrow is not an organ. Red bone marrow is a tissue found inside of bones, and the bone is the organ. Um, but the rest of the bone has nothing to do with the lymphatic system. It's just the red bone marrow there. That's where <coughs> cells are made. It's important because that's where white blood cells are, are, are initially created, that flow chart we just looked at. Um, and then the primary lymphatic organ is the thymus. Now, the reason why these two are set aside as the primary organs or tissues is because this is where white blood cells are made and lymphatic uh, cells, no, not lymphatic cells, immune system cells mature. Um, and the two cells that we're most concerned with are the B and C, B and T cells, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are called T lymphocytes. That T stands for thymus. They're made in the bone marrow along with any other blood cell, but they migrate from the bone marrow to the thymus where they mature. And that's why they're called T cells. They are the cells that go to the thymus to mature. All other blood cells are made in the bone marrow along with T All blood cells are made in the bone marrow. But the other type of immune system, the white blood cell that we're most interested at this point in, the B lymphocyte stays in the bone marrow. So um, one way to maybe help you remember what are the primary organs slash tissues is T for thymus and then B in B lymphocyte, uh, think of that as going with bone marrow. Now, let me just say as an aside, the B for B lymphocyte does not actually stand for bone marrow. It stands for the name of an organ that humans don't have. Um, for whatever historical reason, uh, immunity was originally described in a bird or a bird system. And so uh, there's an organ that birds have, that avians have, that mammals don't have, humans don't have that starts with a B. So the B cells were called B cells because they came from this organ that starts with a B. I'm not going to tell you what that organ's named. If you're very interested in it, you can look it up. Uh, if you take uh, microbiology, they talk about it there because that's not human microbiology, that's just microbiology. But since we're human anatomy and physiology, I'm not going to mention what the B actually stands for because what we want to do is just think of B as standing for bone marrow. Not actually what the B stands for. If you tell Professor Machazic that I told you B stands for bone marrow, he'll laugh at me and I'll explain that you didn't tell him the truth. But so B for bone marrow, T for thymus, because B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow, T lymphocytes mature in the thymus. So the primary lymphatic organ slash tissues are where the cells are born and mature. And then secondary organs are uh, all of the rest of the lymphatic system. So, um, like I said, I put this list in here. I mean, these uh, spots in here, I'm not quite sure how many I need. Um, so, the sort of most important of the lymphatic organs, secondary lymphatic organs to talk about, are lymph nodes. And that's where I want to start. The book actually doesn't start with those, but I'm going to start by talking about the lymph nodes. And then there are tonsils. Um, uh, what's called MALT that stands for mucosa associated 
lymphatic tissue. And, uh, oh, the spleen, which actually I will probably say before malt, and the appendix. Okay, so I didn't need that last one. Um, so first off, let me, um, ah, let me mess everything up. Okay. <clears throat> the order that I'm going to talk about things, I'll put the spleen before malt. Um, <clears throat> so those are the other organs or tissues of the lymphatic system, and they're all classified as secondary because they are not where uh, lymphocytes are born or mature. That's the reason for separating these into primary and secondary um, organs or tissues. Now, for the primary, red bone marrow is a tissue. It's not an organ. And the thymus is an organ. In the secondary list, um, lymph nodes, tonsils, spleen are all organs. Uh, malt, it's right there in the name, is a tissue that's incorporated into organs that have a mucosal lining, which is mainly the digestive tract organs, but uh, uh, we could also think of it as lining the respiratory tract. And then the appendix is an organ, but really the appendix is just a specialized region of uh, the intestines. So what we see in the appendix is really not terribly different from uh, malt, but uh, I want to say something specific about the appendix. So, let's go back to the book. Um, oh, good. The book does deal with lymph nodes. They might have changed this over the, since I've been using this book, but, because it used to start with tonsils, which always bothered me. But, um, The uh, lymph node is sort of the primary, or no, I shouldn't say primary, the uh, best first example of a lymphatic organ. So, um, <clears throat> lymphatic organs are usually characterized by being uh, all made of the same kind of tissue. They're made of reticular connective tissue. And it's contained within a capsule, which is going to be other connective tissue, like a dense connective tissue of some sort. So the capsule on the outside edge is sort of containing everything. And then from the capsule in, it's all reticular tissue. Now, reticular connective tissue uh, varies in its appearance depending on how uh, dense or sparse the cells are in that tissue. The densest the most cell dense parts of the reticular tissue that we see in lymphatic organs is usually referred to as a germinal center. Sometimes they have more specific names, to them, but there's usually a tight little packed area of cells surrounded by lighter staining, less cell dense areas like this. Um, and so as they've drawn it here, uh, the colorized version of the lymph node here. The germinal centers are sort of packed in here and you can usually see a slightly different appearing region of tissue in the middle of that, um, which isn't necessarily a less dense cell packing area, uh, just different cells that are found there. Um, I don't really care that we know exactly what cells are found where and I can't remember now if this book even goes into that. But uh, B cells are found in certain areas, T cells are found in other areas, and certain other types of white blood cells are found scattered around. But all of those cells are kind of uh, packed most closely together in these areas here, surrounded by a less densely packed area. Um, and then just below the capsule, and then extending down into the area of the um, organ are these things called trabeculae, which is fairly cell sparse areas. It's mostly just reticular fibers and extracellular space. 
The reason why that's important is because fluid has to move through all of these. Fluid comes into the lymph nodes through uh, vessels, which are referred to as afferent vessels. The word afferent just means leading to, going into. And so these are the vessels that are carrying the lymph into the lymph node. There are three drawn and labeled in this picture. There's actually two more in this picture, one off to the side here and one off to the side here. They're just not labeled. Um, and all of those are allowing fluid to flow into um, the lymph node. There's going to be a valve at the base of the lymphatic vessel as it attaches so that once fluid moves past that valve, it can't get back out of the lymph node into the afferent. So uh, fluid has to flow in one direction through these afferent vessels. And then um, the fluid flows out through efferent vessels. Afferent means going into, efferent means going away from. And again, there's going to be valves at the base of these vessels ensuring that the fluid only moves in one direction. Once fluid leaves the lymph node and goes into the efferent vessel, it can't get back into the lymph node. How many afferent vessels are pictured in this drawing? Actually, five. I said there's three labeled down here, and they point out the two on either top corner, those are afferent vessels also. How many efferent vessels are there? Right. Well, oh, efferent. Efferent. Two. 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 Okay. There's always more afferent vessels than efferent vessels. Okay. Most pictures will depict something like five to two. Exactly the number doesn't really matter. But there's more input than output. Okay. This helps to keep pressure up in the system. The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like the heart for the cardiovascular system. So it has to take advantage of passive properties to get fluid moving and pumping through uh, the system. If you have five vessels carrying fluid into this lymph node and only two allowing it out, then the pressure is going to increase inside lymph node as it fills with fluid and that's going to help push the fluid out through the efferent vessel. As the fluid accumulates in the lymph node, it can't go back out the afferent vessels because the valves are blocking it from moving the direction. So the only place it can go is the efferent vessel, so there's only two of those compared to the five that allow the fluid to get in, and so pressure just increases. Another thing that helps increase that, which was not depicted in the picture, which I would have liked to have pointed out with before, is lymph nodes are usually found in their highest concentration or highest number around joints. Um, you have um, axial, no, axillary lymph nodes, which means that they're at your armpit. You have cervical lymph nodes because they're around your neck. You have inguinal lymph nodes because they're around your groin. Um, and then there's also some around other uh, joints. As you move your body, um, whether you're turning your head or walking uh, or swinging your arms, the tissue at those joints is going to compress and stretch out with each movement of that joint. And if you compress the tissue around the lymph node, it's going to squeeze it, increasing the pressure in the lymph node even more and forcing more fluid out through the efferent vessels. Um, that's not to say that lymph nodes are only found in joints. They are found elsewhere, but the majority of them are around joints because the compression of the tissue as you move a joint is going to help sort of squeeze things and push the uh, fluid along. Okay. As that fluid comes in, it enters into what's called the subcapsular sinus, which is labeled here. That's a little bit of cell sparse area, mostly extracellular space, which the fluid can fill up. And then it's going to move down into the trabeculae, which are just a continuation of the subcapsular sinus. Other sources will talk about the subcapsular sinus and the trabecular sinus, um, just spaces within the lymph node that fluid can flow through pretty easily. As a fluid flows down through these trabeculae, it'll get to the center or the middle of the lymph node, which is called the medulla, and there's medullary sinuses. Um, 
just more space for fluid to, fluid to flow through, which will direct all the fluid towards the efferent vessels. So the fluid actually flows. Actually, let me write this down. So um, fluid enters through the afferent vessels to the uh, subcapsular sinus and into the trabec trabecular sinus then to the medullary sinus, which is not, uh, the trabecular sinus and the medullary sinus I don't think are labeled in the pictures in the book. And then to the efferent vessels. Fluid has to flow that direction through things, just the way that things are set up. If you have a lot of extra fluid th flowing through your lymphatic system, um, which happens when you have an infection, then the fluid will uh, seep into the more cell dense parts of the lymph node. But primarily it's going through this area, especially when you're not fighting off an infection and you have normal fluid levels in your system. This basic structure of a lymph node is repeated in the other structures. Um, and so I want to kind of talk about the other structures in terms of how they're similar and different to lymph nodes and how that informs us about what they do. Okay. So I first want to back up for a second to this picture of the thymus. The book shows us the thymus before it get, they get to the lymph node because it's a primary structure, primary organ. But um, within the structure of the thymus, there is the same basic tissue arrangement. There's a capsule, there are germinal centers, all that stuff is in there. Um, the thymus is a huge gland. It's much, much bigger than lymph node. And it's not primarily there for draining fluid, although fluid does pass through it just like it would for a lymph node. But uh, it's more important in the location of where T cells mature. And we'll talk about that process later on. Um, oh, the other thing about the limb, the thymus is uh, in pretty much everybody in this room, I would imagine at this point, your thymus doesn't do anything. And I say pretty much everybody in this room because I don't know everybody's exact age, but somewhere towards the end of adolescence, beginning of adulthood, meaning somewhere between 15 and 25 years uh, of age, depending on the person, the thymus stops functioning. It's really only there for childhood and adolescence as the immune system is developing. But then as we get older, the thymus ends up becoming more and more adipose tissue and a non-functional gland. Uh, we don't see the thymus in like those torso model, model torso models that we have in lab for two reasons. One, that torso model is of an adult and the thymus is not a functional gland in an adult. And two, it blocks our view of the heart. So it's just left out of those um, uh, models. But it's when we get to the adult stage, the thymus, thymus isn't really doing anything. As we consider the thymus, it's really about the development of the system. Um, oh, I actually put uh, tonsil next to my list, but the the spleen is the next one in the pictures. So let me just talk about that. Um, so the spleen is located in the upper uh, left quadrant, um, just adjacent to the um, diaphragm and sort of, uh, well, the, the curve and the large intestine that goes right back by here sometimes referred to as the splenic flexure. And then the, the tail of the pancreas is going to be right there, too. Um, and then what we don't see is the stomach sitting in front of that, which sort of fits into that part of the spleen. Um, 
Under the micro uh, microscope, what we see is very similar to the structure of a lymph node. We have clustered cell dense areas um, and cell sparse areas like the trabeculae that we mentioned. This particular um, micrograph doesn't show us the edge of the spleen, but it has a capsule and a subcapsular sinus and all of that. Um, so the spleen is kind of like one big lymph node. However, what's really different about it is that it doesn't have afferent vessels coming into it. Instead, it has a splenic artery bringing blood into it. <clears throat> the capillaries between the splenic artery and the splenic veins are practically non-existent. They're sinusoidal capillaries at best. Really, the blood that comes into the spleen just perfuses through the whole organ. Um, because the spleen is really primarily a filter for blood. Um, and uh, where the uh, blood sort of perfuses through the tissue, we call that the red pulp. Mm -hmm. And then there are some areas where there's not a whole lot of blood uh, collecting, and that's what we call the white pulp, which is uh, consistent with what we've called germinal centers before. It's where white blood cells cluster within the spleen. And those white blood cells will play a big role in immune surveillance, watching uh, potential pathogens that move through the bloodstream directly. It's also a location where we clear away old red blood cells as they've lived out their 120-day lifespan, that kind of stuff. Um, and then any other kind of debris or whatever that might be passing through the bloodstream. All that gets filtered out in the um, spleen. So the spleen's kind of like one big lymph node but instead of processing lymph, it's actually processing blood, but for the lymphatic system. And then the blood drains away through the uh, splenic vein. Oh, that's right. This is the weird thing. So when I was saying earlier that the book started with tonsils, that's actually an old book. Um, here's where the book talks about tonsils. Um, but it talks about it under the heading of lymphatic I forgot what the term was. Um, lymphoid no nodules. So a nodule is just a little cluster of um, lymphatic tissue, <clears throat> which you can kind of say that's what a, a tonsil is. There are other structures besides tonsils that fall into that group. And actually, it moves into that malt that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but the tonsils are. Uh, lymphatic nodules that are exposed on the surface. Um, and I'd almost call them a separate organ rather than just uh, structures of tissue. They're just sort of attached to something. So for example, this is a drawing suggesting a lingual tonsil, which is attached to the back of the tongue. Sort of. So the black and white lines here are representing the muscle structure of the tongue. And then here colored in is the um, lingual tonsil. The palatine tonsil is found in the uh, soft palate, roof of your mouth. Um, there's also a pharyngeal tonsil found where the nasal cavity opens up into the pharynx. Um, and then uh, I guess those are the main tonsils. Um, there are other nodules that are sometimes referred to as adenoids. They're uh, kind of like tonsils, but kind of not. We're not going to talk about them other than to just mention that they exist. The tonsils, however, I do want to talk about oh, in more detail. And I just want to zoom in on this micrograph down here. Um, Tissue-wise, if you look at the tonsil, the lymphoid nodule that is a tonsil, it's arranged in the same kind of tissue structure as a lymph node. Uh, there's different areas of cell density within the tissue. There are germinal centers like we saw in the lymph node, et cetera, et cetera. The difference, however, is again, like the spleen, there are not afferent vessels carrying lymph into the tonsils. Now for the spleen, it was instead that the splenic artery was carrying blood into the spleen. For the tonsils, there's not afferent tissues because of fluid that's getting into the tonsils is really fluid that's uh, being absorbed across the capsule of the um, 
organ. Um, now, this is a knife cut here, this flat edge, but you can see this little crevice coming down in here, and it's lined with an epithelium. Uh, and so fluid that gets down into this crevice gets absorbed across here, and then that can move on. Um, that crevice is what's called a crypt. And there are a lot of crypts in your tonsils. Um, actually, let me go up here. Um, as they've drawn this uh, pharyngeal tonsil, these kind of folds here uh, and have a lot of crypts coming off of them going deeper into that tissue. Um, <clears throat> Tonsils are arranged around the opening of the nasal and oral cavities, and they're primarily responsible for sur uh, immune surveillance of airborne and foodborne pathogens. So if you eat some food that has, let's say, E. coli in it, God forbid, um, a little bit of that food is going to work its way down into a crypt, and the E. coli bacteria that uh, we're suggesting are part of that food will find a nice, warm, moist place to reproduce. Okay. Um, it's a nice neighborhood, great schools, great place to raise a family, all that. What they don't realize is that their neighbors on the other side of the fence are white blood cells that are there to kill them. Okay. Uh, yes, it got very dark very quick, I'm sorry. But um, that's what the crypts are there for. It's a nice place for foodborne pathogens to, to hang out. But it also is right there next to white blood cells that are paying attention to the things that might be getting into our system. The white blood cells in the tonsils can then move through the lymphatic system elsewhere and tell the lymphatic tissue around your digestive tract or something like that, that you just ingested some pathogens, your immune system needs to be ready to fight that off, that sort of thing. You've probably had experience with things getting caught in your Crips. So if you've eaten some food and then it just feels like there's something stuck in the back of your mouth, throat, that, that kind of feeling, like you, that's a little food in the crypt. Okay. Um, and it's there so that you're sort of sampling a little bit of the food that comes through so that your immune system can pay attention to the possibility that something's there. Yeah. Um, so the tonsils surveil for immune surveillance. Air. Mm -hmm. And what else? Well, they're looking for airborne and foodborne pathogens. They're not looking at the air. What they're looking at is the fluid that's passing over it. So foodborne pathogens are very easy because the food you're eating is dissolving into saliva. For airborne pathogens, the way that works is when you inhale air, um, any particles in the air that you inhale will end up getting dissolved into the mucus. That stuff. And then that drains from your nasal passage across the pharyngeal tonsil, and then the mucus goes down your throat. And so any pathogens that are caught in that mucus will pass over the pharyngeal tonsil. And the same thing will happen there. There's crypts and all that stuff there. So. Um, question or stretch? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, is there any specific reason why a lot of people have their tonsils removed? Like so um, the tonsils and the appendix, which I'm not going to get a whole lot of time to talk about, uh, <clears throat> get removed often because their immune system function is to be this sentry looking for the possibility of uh, infection. And the infection gets into the tonsil or the appendix. And um, in old days, before medical science gave us the ability to have tonsillectomies or appendectomies, um, if the infection got to the point where it overtook that organ, you would die. Nowadays, uh, those organs are sort of there as our last chance before medical intervention can take place. Okay. And hopefully, you know, you have your tonsils or your appendix removed and you get rid of that particular infection, and then you're not going to be faced with the same sort of problem in the future. So you can have your tonsils forever as long as it doesn't... Right. I've never had my talking no. tonsils taken out. So just a matter of if you've been in a situation where the tonsils are so inflamed. And I don't believe these days they take tonsils out so much. Um, I think they t tend to leave tonsils intact. Um, I can't remember if it's that they'll just scrape off the infected tissue, which you can probably do just from an oral uh, approach or something like that, um, or what. But uh, yeah, tonsillectomies I think are getting to be less and less common. So, uh, 
Oh. Um, so uh, the last picture here is of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, which is just lymphoid nodules that are in the mucus layer, mucosal layer, of organs like the small intestines or the uh, stomach or whatever, just as uh, foodborne pathogens are moving through your digestive tract, there's more lymphatic tissue to deal with that. Um, then in the book, they mention bronchus-associated lymphatic tissue, which is this is the first place I've ever seen it mentioned specifically there. But that's just mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue in the respiratory tract. It's the same thing for airborne pathogens. Um, if there were a picture of the appendix, this could basically be it. The appendix is just a little special worm-shaped thing. It's called the vermiform appendix, which means worm-shaped. Little piece of this large intestine. Um, you probably learned that it was a vestigial organ. You were lied to. It's not a vestigial organ. It's just it's been re uh, <coughs> re imagined, if you will. I, uh, the word I want to use is a saving there. Um, in non primate mammals, there's a big part of the large intestine that does something that we as primates don't need it to do. Um, our appendix is essentially a thing that an, or, uh, an animal like a dog uses to process uh, plant fiber-based food. Okay. But primates, and I say primates because this includes monkeys and other apes, um, our diet is based on eating a lot of vegetable products. Okay. Monkeys and trees will eat things. Uh, apes will eat uh, leaves and whatnot. So our large intestine can process plant matter on its own doesn't need that thing that dogs have or cats have to process that. And it's become the appendix. And so it's really just an area with a lot of <coughs> mucosa associated lymphatic tissue that helps us regulate the presence of uh, bacteria that live in our large intestine that help us digest that plant matter. Okay. Um, you can have it removed, but it's not a vestigial organ. Okay. Um, if in grade school you learn that because they said, oh, you can have your appendix removed, why didn't they teach you that the spleen or the tonsils are vestigial also because you can have those removed? Okay. Same, they just you take them out because they've become infected, but they were there doing a very important job keeping you from dying. So uh, I just wanted to finish off that thing about the appendix before we close up. Uh, then we'll continue on from here talking about immune system function. And uh, the Wednesday group uh, tomorrow, lab practice.